Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our passage for tonight is going to come from Luke chapter 22, beginning with verse 14 and going through verse 30. So hear the word of the Lord. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they begin to ask one another which one of them it could be who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called the benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you, just as my Father has conferred on me, a kingdom, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. This is the word of the Lord, and together we give thanks. Thanks be to God. Holy God, we invite your presence to be with each of us as we are in our homes. Uh, whether we are by ourselves or gathered with our families. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. So this story is a little familiar to all of us. Uh, it's, it's the time of the Passover feast, this sacred festival which was a solemn reminder for the people of Israel of the mighty hand of God and how God had worked uh, in their presence while they were slaves and captive in the land of Egypt. It's a spotlight moment in history for God's people. Hopelessly, they were trapped under the oppressive thumb of a tyrant king. It's the gods of Egypt, the gods with whips, with chariots, with magicians, the gods of the empire against God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the great I am that I am who has heard the cries of his people, has seen the oppression, and has come down to do something about it. This is the mighty hand of God that is stretched out against Egypt in judgment, and there was no contest. Sign after sign, the power of the gods of Egypt was brought forth, it was challenged, and then it was overcome. And it cultivated in the final two signs where the sun god, Ra, the king of the gods, was stripped of his power, three days of darkness, and then the final sign, the death of the firstborn, and the prayers and the cries for resurrection from the people of Egypt to the god Anubis, who they believed was the god of the afterlife. They went unanswered. And the last god to fall was Pharaoh, Pharaoh, in all of his power and might, with his chariots and soldiers, is swept up in the waters of the Red Sea. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has triumphed gloriously, and now the people are free. We move to the passage of Scripture that we have read together this evening. And Jesus had sent his disciples into town with very clear instructions for how they were supposed to to prepare a place so that they could share in the Passover meal together, be reminded of God's mighty acts, and that they are a free people. 
that there are two things going on in this story that were undoubtedly on Jesus' mind. The first is that Jesus will soon be betrayed. He'll be handed over to the religious leaders of the Jewish people who will then give him over to the Roman authorities who will sentence him to die of suffocation, humiliation, and isolation on a Roman cross. Not only that, but Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, will use his intimate relationship with Jesus for his own personal gain. He'll turn a sacred place that Jesus had shared with them time and time again into a garden of betrayal. He'll have the audacity to greet Jesus with a kiss, and in so doing will corrupt an act of love and replace it with a painful betrayal. And he'll do all of this for 30 pieces of silver, thus valuing a prophet over a person. And Jesus knows this, but he doesn't ask Judas not to come to the Last Supper. The night is for him too. The other issue is that the disciples have chosen to spend these final precious moments together, arguing over which one of them is the greatest, who has the higher status, who is the most revered, who is going to sit at Jesus' right and Jesus' left, and they've missed it. They've missed it. Three years of being with Jesus every single day, hearing his his teaching, seeing the miracles and the signs he was doing, and they've missed it. The marks of the empire are present in the room during the Last Supper. The ghosts of Egypt linger in the empty spaces of the sacred place, whispering, corrupting, trying to secure their legacy and memory. So the Passover lamb speaks. This is my body. This is my blood. This is my body. In a world consumed by a mindset of the survival of the fittest, where we have to get all that we can before the greedy people beat us to it, where there isn't enough to go around, so you might as well go ahead and get all that you can. Exploit. Take advantage. Let the whips of Egypt crack and the work be doubled. Our Passover lamb says, this is my body, broken for you. Take my life, take all that I am, I give it freely so that you may have life and have it to the fullest. Greater love has no one than this, that they would lay down their lives for their friends. This is my blood. This is the sign of the kingdom that is coming and has now already come. One in which life is found in the very midst of sacrifice and service. That the life force of us all is given for the benefit of others. That our life would shine a light on the powers of sin and death and expose them for the hollow empty shadows that they are. Just like the Exodus story, Jesus stands in opposition on this night. Stands in opposition against the powers that have lingered throughout all time. That hold people captive and make their lives bitter. That makes them cry out with cries of injustice. And Jesus has heard the cries. And he's seen the oppression. And he has come down to do something about it. Much like how the Passover functioned as a tool of remembrance, the practice of communion does the same for us. We do not partake to simply remind ourselves of the sacrifice of Jesus, his death and resurrection. That's only a piece of it. We do so to remind ourselves of a Savior who beckons us to live the same kind of life. Wake up, you sleeper, life has come. By the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, you and I are being transformed into a people who are free from the death-dealing realities of this world. And it starts tonight. It starts with the breaking of bread and the giving of the cup. This is my body, 
broken and poured out for you, go and do likewise. This is my blood poured out for you. Go and do likewise. Friends, we are to be a communion people marked by these very kinds of sacrificial love. These instances where we are broken and poured out for the rest of the world who doesn't deserve it just like we don't. The world will know that we are a communion people, a Eucharist people, by the way we love one another and by the way we love them. Thanks be to God.